Hey y'all, welcome to the channel. I'm Task Force Bourbon. And tonight we have a very special blind flight fight stored up for you all. We have Old Rip Van Winkle versus Old Weller Antique, known in the community as OWA. <clears throat> right, again, versus Old Rip Van Winkle. There is uh, very close uh, similarities between these two. We're gonna get into that a little bit later. We'll talk first, like we do with all my uh, channel uh, content about each one of these separately, a little bit about the history, and then why these make sense together. I'm a firm believer if you do a blind flight fight, it should make sense. You shouldn't pair up, you know, a weeded bourbon versus a high rye bourbon versus whatever. I mean, drink your bourbon the way you want to, all right? I'm, I'm all for that as well, but a blind flight really should be a, a mechanism for you all to compare one thing against another thing, right? Not steak versus chicken. It should be steak versus a different steak, right? So with that lead in, we'll go ahead and start first with Old Rip Van Winkle because really that's what we're here to, to determine is does the overly hyped or maybe adequately hyped Van Winkle, right, part of the Pappy lineup live up to all of that hype, right? Well, but that starts back with Julian P. Pappy Van Winkle Sr.'s involvement, which began in 1893 as a traveling salesman for W.L. Weller & Sons. He and a co-worker eventually merged the 8PH Stitzel Distillery, which produced bourbon for, well, uh, for Weller. The companies merged to become eventually Stitzel Weller Distillery. Opened on Derby Day of 1935, Stitzel Weller quickly became known for its weeded bourbon uh, recipe using wheat instead of rye for the mash bill for a softer, smoother taste. For those of you who hold don't know, bourbon is traditionally has to be 51% or more corn, followed by the secondary or flavoring grain, as it's known, and that typically is rye, right? They brought in wheat, which again has that softer, smoother taste that's more approachable uh, and is now widely considered some of the best uh, bourbons on the market. Up until his death in 1965, Pappy was the oldest active distiller in the nation at the age of 91. His son, Julian Jr., ran operations at Sitzel Weller until its sale in 1972. Sometime after the sale, Julian Ju uh, Jr. resurrected the pre-prohibition Old Rip Van Winkle brand initially using old whiskey stocks from the distillery for its bottlings. Julian Jr. died in 1981, and Julian III took over the company. In 2001, his son Preston joined the company, but since 2002, all right, that's a lot of dates, but since 2002, the brands have been distilled and bottled at Buffalo Trace as a joint venture, but under strict Van Winkle supervision. Though the label says Old Rip Van Winkle Distillery, that's merely branding. No physical Old Rip Van Winkle distillery has ever existed, as we just discussed. No matter the case, they continue to operate by Pappy's old motto, quote, we make fine bourbon at a profit if we can, at a loss if we must, but always fine bourbon. All right. Now, as a point of fact, for those bourbon enthusiasts that might tune in or watch this later, this is not Pappy. This is part of the Van Winkle lineup that includes Pappy, right? and using all the same things that Pappy has, just aged longer, bottled at different proofs, respectively. Um, it is the entry level of that, that uh, lineup. The Pappy name is allocated, pun intended, uh, for those that are part of the Pappy Van Winkle's Family Reserve lineup. Those are explicitly, right now, 15, 20, and 23 year olds, right? Um, this one was aged 10 summers, um, which means 10 years, and is bottled at 107 proof. Now, 107 proof has got a really cool side history in bourbon, uh, you know, uh, folklore, really. But uh, the one I'll leave you all here today with is one from Sally Van Winkle Campbell, Pappy's granddaughter, who relates a story that, quote, the reason that the distiller came out with 107 proof was because Pap's doctor said he could only have two drinks a day. So might as well make him 107 proof, I guess. That Pappy craze started back in 96. For those who don't, don't uh, know so, so much about the Van Winkle, uh, you know, Pappy lineup, um, when uh, the Van Winkle 20 year was uh, submitted to the prestigious Beverage Testing Institute, where it scored at the time uh, the highest rating it had ever given a 99. All right. So factor that in with the fact that they only produce about 84,000 bottles a year. It's about, I think, about 7,000 cases uh, for really what's scarcity. Uh, this is exaggerated by the angel share of evaporating of the products that matures, especially those 15, 20, 23 years. Um, you know, sometimes they've actually uncorked a barrel or, you know, took a barrel off, getting ready to dump it and do its thing. And it was completely empty. 
And we have a quote from uh, Preston Van Winkle who says, every now and again, you'll see the word empty on a barrel and that's just a gut punch. I, I can only imagine. <clears throat> but according to the interview with Julian III in Fortune Magazine, this is a quote, strategy of scarcity intended to build their brand. When the Wall Street Journal asked him about the astronomical prices people were paying, he just replied, quote, if they're dumb enough to pay that much, that's their prerogative. Right, and I'll, I'll say, I'll echo that as much as well. You know, I, I, I can't necessarily condone paying, th you know, $4,000 for a bottle of Pappy 23 year when it goes for 300 some odd dollars MSRP. Now that might be a little way you can get it if you got the means, good for you, um, send me some. <clears throat> but moving over to Old Weller Antique. This brand dates, dates back, back to the 1940s when Julian Van Winkle wanted to reach out to the market that still remembered purchasing whiskey from a barrel at a liquor store or saloon, right? That's how they used to do it. They would cork it up, you know, you know, or un, un, uh, unhead a, a barrel of bourbon and allow those to come in with their own, you know, grogs as it were, or, or barrels or jugs and just take, scoop it right out. So that's straight from the barrel, right? Or that's, you know, what we know is cash tank barrel proof for sure nowadays. Right, that also has some other issues, you know, inject, you know, bottle and bond act, you know, making sure that uh, that product actually is, you know, what it really should 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 have in it is just bourbon. But that's another story for another another day. It was then called at the time Weather Original Barrel Proof. It had a seven year age statement and it was bottled at the proof it came out of the barrel lab. Um, and that was 110 at the time. Uh, a few years later, the decision was bottled. Uh, was made to bottle it at the barrel entry proof at 107. In the late 1960s, it was decided that it would be called antique with a parchment style label and the portrait of Julian Van Winkle on one side of the label and W.L. Weller's portrait on the other side. It was called antique at seven years old because until 1958, the bonding period was only eight years. At the end of eight years, the distiller had to remove the whiskey from the bonded warehouses and pay the excise taxes on the whiskey. Needless to say, most distillers then bottle the whiskey for sale rather than returning it to the barrels for further aging and further evaporation. Seven years old was indeed antique by the standard before 1958 when most whiskey was bottled at four to six years of age. After the family sold the distillery, the portrait uh, of Van Winkle was dropped from the label and Weller graced both sides of the label. It no longer carries an age statement, and in 2016, the three core releases underwent a label redesign. So that includes the old Weller antique, the red label you see here, the Weller Special Reserve Green Label and uh, Weller 12 Year, the Black Label. OWA is, in fact, older than Weller Special Reserves. It has a higher proof than Weller 12, so it's priced right in the middle in terms of pricing and aged typically around six to eight years, although most believe that it does still kind of have that seven year, so six to eight makes sense. Um, notably, these both use the same Buffalo tra Trace mash bill, right? So when they brought that over in 2002, you know, they, they started really making the same Buffalo Trace mash bill. So I forget which year, but eventually the Pappy lineup no longer has that old Stitzel Weller stock that they brought over when, you know, they, uh, they, they merged, right? So you can find old Stitzel Weller stock, as they call it, but now all the stuff produced is, in fact, using Buffalo Trace's weeded mash bill, which is undisclosed, like all their mash bills. Um, but we speculate it to be about 70% corn, 16% wheat, and 14% malted barley. Um, all right, so what else I want to make sure? So really wanted to do a, a recap of all, all the, you know, the differences between these two, right? Um, age, we have 10 years versus non-age stated, but speculated between six to eight, probably seven. Both 107, both from Buffalo Trace. Both are weeded mash bills from Buffalo Trace, the same mash bill. Both are chilled filtration. However, right, comma, the OWA offering does offer a non-chilled filtered option uh, for those single barrel selects. So not all of them, but some of them have do, do have an option to be non-chill filtered. But their standard stuff, like we see here, is chill filtered just like over at Van Winkle. The difference is that Van Winkle family. Uh, amongst a couple, you know, core players in the Buffalo Trace team, pick this. They get first pick, what are called honey barrels, right? So those are select or premium uh, barrels in the rickhouse aging. Now, again, it's speculated, but we believe that those come from the lower floors of the rickhouses, right? That's so that they can age longer, right? There, there's a lot of variables and, and why that might be important, but generally they get, first, they, well, they do get first pick, but generally they come from the lower floors of the warehouse. They are all labeled Weller. So all the, the barrel heads 
that have the Weeden Bourbon are all branded Weller until the Van Winkle and, and the team that's going to pick them come by and pick it when they meet certain age age ranges, of course. Uh, the difference, too, here is a press. Uh, so Julian III has been quoted as saying that his offering, excuse me, over here, is a batch size of a rough, roughly five to six barrels, right, versus, again, speculation. We don't know for sure, but we believe this to be somewhere in the 100-plus range. So big difference, right? That, that's another. So this is, if you will, one could view this, right, uh, over at Van Winkle, or, or excuse me, um, yeah, uh, over at Van Winkle as old Weller Antique Van Winkle pick, right? That's about five to six, you know, barrels versus 100 plus uh, and a couple years older. So seven maybe, so about three years older, Van Winkle picked, right? So theoretically, um, if, if, if I'm just a, you know, bourbon enthusiast like I am, you know, and you just told me those facts, maybe you threw out the Van Winkle name because I probably know what you're talking about. I would probably pick this. So that's what we're going to go ahead and do. It's plus all the hype. So the prices are right now it used to be lower, but right right now it's roughly MSRP of fifty dollars versus um, seventy dollars MSRP. Now, good luck unless you won like a lottery at you know one of your liquor stores or you know you just I don't know they say get have good relationships with your liquor store owners. I haven't been fortunate enough to have you know one so tight that they gave me an old Rip Van Winkle at MSRP, but you know, teach their own and, you know, good luck everybody hunting. But generally, you're not going to find this for 70 bucks on MSRP. This, this goes anywhere between 850 to 1100 bucks, depending on the secondary market you're, you're looking at. So is it worth that? I, I, I don't think I've found a bourbon that's worth a thousand bucks personally. Um, but, but again, that's all relative to your own, own means. So we are here to find out which one is better by way of blind flight. So I got glass one and glass two. I don't know what's in one, any of these, uh, you know, which one's which. So I'm just gonna start left to right and work my way back and forth and figure out which one I like better. Right up front, just kind of looking over the top, and maybe it's the lighting, but the glass two looks a touch darker, which shouldn't, which might suggest age. So just right on, right on the look here, maybe this one has a bit more, you know, deeper color to it, which again could suggest age since I know they're, you know, the same proof, but. Really light nose on glass one. Glass two has a much richer, fuller nose. Uh, a little bit of oak standing in. Again, it's gonna kind of back my belief that this might right off the bat be the old rip. And I hate that I can, you know, I don't try to do the guessing game, but sometimes it feels like it might be obvious. But you know, I've been proven wrong and looking dumb on my channel before, so why stop now? Standard stuff here on the glass one. Vanilla, some some kind of some caramel, so a little feels like the the nose is watered down. But I I've always said I have a better palate than I do a nose. So let's with that, let's go ahead and dive right into the first glass. So I haven't had any um bourbon yet today, and uh, 107, you know, it isn't necessarily something I consider a high proof. Really, that's reserved for something 120 and up. Um, but it, it did pack a little bit of a punch right away. So I, I need to kind of do that. My Kentucky, uh, you know, three step sipping process here, starting with sip one, take a very small thing, wash it around, let my palate acclimate step two to a Kentucky chew, coat that whole tongue, get all aspects of the tongue, see how it kind of creeps up and down the tongue and where it might hit the sweet, sweet, savory, you know, all those, all those, um, parts of the tongue there, and then really start diving into sip, the tasting notes. Hmm. So a lot more flavors on the second sip. Um, I'm getting some sort of uh, maybe apricots and oranges. Again, your standard stuff I'm not even mentioning, but you know, your vanillas and caramels are there. There's really nothing significant uh, on those flavor points, but they are present. Oak, there is some oak. Uh, it tastes like a, like a charred oak, not a heavy charred oak, but like a charred oak. Not like it's uh, like to your age stuff, sort of like it starts melting away. You can almost taste it. It's not like starting to like rot in a very fantastic way. Um, none of that kind of age statement is really there. So again, that kind of leads me to maybe it's, you know, the red label here. Okay. Well, it's obviously first in first place right now. 
because I haven't had glass two yet. Oh, this one's sweeter. Um, a little less than that charred kind of piece I was talking about before in the glass one. Um, maybe some toffees on there. Um, I, I get, I think maybe a bit more of the wheat notes that I like on a weeder. I think wheat bourbons do much better at a lower proof if you're looking for a wheat bourbon, because I love Larceny Barrel Proof, for example. Uh, well, approved proof's great. Um, so, you know, I do think they can do well at a high proof, but they taste less like wheat bourbons and more like a really good bourbon, if that makes sense. So when I want a wheat bourbon, I want a wheat bourbon, you know, uh, and I think that's better done in the 90, you know, hunts, maybe 100 sub 100 range. And so 107, obviously kind of right on that cusp. Um, I don't know if I got the best of the wheat on the glass one, but the glass two, I definitely got, I think, more wheat notes. Oh, and as an aside, these are both from 2021 for those interested. Maybe some tobacco notes also on, on glass too, for sure. But I'm not really here to do tasting notes. Just kind of a happy stance. There's, there's clove on both. Maybe a bit more clove. So the char, I think, evolves to a clove note on glass too. I'm sliding glass too forward, I think. Um, for now, I'm gonna take a little pause X here, take a little swig of water. Uh, And uh, maybe maybe try this again because you know why rush why rush uh, you know the blind here. So these have been sitting out for a few minutes now. Um, I, I I do believe bourbon can open up. I think the neck pour is a thing. I don't. I'm not saying that that thing is a bad thing or a good thing, but I do think like wine, like you would allow a wine to open up. If you're going to do something like this or you're going to get precise tasting notes it would be uh it would do you well or serve you well to let them sit for a few moments and let the let them open up now when it gets to a certain point the the oxygen will oxidize the bottle so if it gets like quarter or less or a third or less some you know that that argument you know remains in the community but it is a scientifically proven fact that your bourbon will change adversely right so that's bad um, when it reaches a certain point, you know, where too much oxygen is doing, doing harm to it. Um, but in a short amount, you know, whether it's five, 10 minutes, three, five, 10, 10 minutes, whatever, let it open up, you know, that can, you know, really allow that bourbon to, to, to do better things. So I think we're going to do the same thing. Just go glass one, glass two. Medium bodied. Really nice bourbon. I'm a huge fan of OWA. Um, and I've had two years of Old Rip. Uh, I forget my other year, but one I rated a 4.0, one I rated a 4.5. This one, uh, I, this is a brand new fresh crack that I just cracked for this one. But uh, the OWA I had prior to where I rated it was a 4.5. Uh, and I can't recall the year of that one, but so kind of equal depending on the year, I guess. Uh, this is, uh, like I said, an annual thing. Uh, this not so much. Glass two is more more fuller. I don't know if I'd call it a full body, but a medium to full. It's definitely more fuller than glass one. Um, this one has a sort of a, a citrus kind of, um, tinge on the, on the very tail, very finish of my, uh, my sip there, but I think I'm going to call it, <sighs> no, one last time. I swear it's my last time. I just want to be sure because right now I've got glass two, you know, coming in front. Uh, and I want to make sure I like glass two right now today because so far, because it's uh, offering more of a fuller experience 
Um, it's got richer, more complex flavors. Whereas I think glass one has more of, it's, it's more of that subtle thing. Even it feels like it's a lower proof, but obviously they're both 107. Okay. Where's the glass two? I'm gonna pull pull the trigger on the fuller bodied experience. This one does have a touch clove on the end too. I think I said that earlier. That I'm not a huge fan of clove, but it's it's there. It's probably the only con I'm gonna I'm gonna give it in you know my opinion. Clove's not a bad thing. Um, you know, like a note like orange zest might suggest uh, a younger age dated bourbon. A clove doesn't really suggest to me uh, any anything adverse in the bourbon. It's just a note that you know I'm not the biggest fan of. Even with that, I'm still thinking I'm gonna pull the trigger on glass two. So without further ado, I guess we'll start with glass number one. Coming in last place is OWA, which I don't even really need to put the card because there's only two on the table, but that leaves Old Rip Van Winkle as glass number one uh, being the winner. So, you know, coming into this thing, we did say um, that if you put those facts out on the table, age, you know, all those other, you know, it's a select uh, of the honey spot of OW, you know, what would otherwise could be OWA in a few years, you're going to, you know, you're going to pick on paper. This makes sense. And a blind for me, it won out. Do I think it's worth a thousand bucks? No. Uh, do I think it's the uh, 70 bucks is worth for? Yes. Um, do I still think OWA is a fantastic bourbon? especially considering it's more available reasonably. Absolutely. OWA is one I would call a daily, right? I got to be careful with that word around alcohol, but I do think OWA is a great, great bourbon. And I think depending on the, the, the season you're in, the feel that you have that day, you might pick OWA because I think this is a little bit more subtle, maybe a more, a little more balanced, uh, and it's definitely going to be more consistent because, like I said, I've had two different years where I rated 4.0 and a 4.5, meaning one of those years would have, I didn't do the blind, but theoretically would have lost against OWA. So with that said, I would recommend if you if you can, uh, do this blind yourself, challenge yourself. Um, and then if you could, if I had the uh, means myself, I would have done Old Rip Van Winkle, OWA Standard Edition stuff, and then OWA Non-Chill Filtered. That would be truly the blind flight of blind flights for this sake, right? To really experience all the different variations of this brand. But, you know, there you have it. Those are the findings. And to that, I say thanks for tuning in. Make sure you like, subscribe, all that good fun stuff. And cheers. It's good bourbon.